Hello everybody, uh, Patrick here with uh, this week's lecture on Heidegger. So this week we're going to be looking at Heidegger and uh, the question of science. And this is a continuation on of some of the themes that we've been doing already. Uh, I guess with the question of science, the, 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 the key thing to be keeping in mind is the question of uh, technology. So what Heidegger has to say about science is in some ways an elongation of what he has to say about the nature of uh, technology and technological thinking and what he calls calculative thinking. Now what I'm going to do today with you is I'm going to talk about, I'm going to try and first try and understand what science is, what do scientists do uh, and you know what is the empirical spirit and how that relates to the question of uh, philosophy. I'm also going to look a little bit about what the question of uh, the philosophy of science is, which is, uh, I think, slightly a slightly different enterprise. Um, but it's a, it's important to have a, a sense of that if we want to understand what Heidegger is trying to to say about uh, the nature of science and uh, how 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 science works and how science contributes to thinking. How does science contribute to thinking? Uh, because one of the famous things that Heidegger, of course, says, and I'm going to be finishing the lecture with this as well, I hope, uh, Heidegger famously says science does not think. Now, I want you to have a sort of mull that over in your mind and also bring that to the seminar the next day. But science does not think. Now, why on earth would anybody uh, say that? Okay, so that's the guiding uh, question. Uh, I'm also today going to be looking at the question of, um, I'm going to see what Heidegger has to say about uh, the question of uh, truth. We're going to have to sort of revisit that question, which we've already looked at, and uh, how that links to the question concerning technology, and how sci we look at uh, science as a mode of inquiry. And also, I'm going to be asking, I suppose, what is the kind of the historical basis of scientific inquiry, and what is its place in the world, and what is it as its place for for human beings? Okay, so uh, to begin with, then. Let's just look at the things here. What in terms of what uh, science does? In terms of what you know, scientists scientists do in their everyday activities. Well, there's a certain section. There's a certain set of uh, practices, I suppose. Now, this is not exhaustive, but it is. It does give us uh, a sense of the types of things that scientists do in laboratories, say. You know, are the types of things that, sci that constitutes scientific activity. Now, it's certainly not exhaustive. Well, if we look at these, so these are the things that could be associated with the empirical worldview. So, the scientist is into observation. This is kind of this comes out of natural philosophy or empiricism. The idea that if you want to understand the world, you want to understand how the world is, what constitutes the, the external world, or what counts for knowledge about the external world, we need to observe it. We need to see what's going on there. We need to record it, uh, and we need to, I suppose, come up with rec replicable uh, knowledge about that world. So, if you say do like an experiment, well, how you know the the results of that have to be replicable. I mean, you know, you have to, they have to be repeated before they count for knowledge. Uh, other activities uh, include, uh, so that brings us on to our dimension, which is testing. Uh, we need to test our hypotheses about the world to see that they cohere into recognisable patterns. Uh, so that also involves a level of uh, detection. Uh, other things include uh, experimentation, modelling. Uh, the last two points there on the slide, I think, are the, probably the important ones. Uh, so the first five I've mentioned uh, incorporate the, um, the, 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 the the practices I suppose that scientists do. The last two the last two are I suppose more about the values of science. The more the, what what kind of values does one have to adopt if one is to engage in scientific inquiry. And those include disinterest, neutrality and objectivity. Now it's odd saying why why we say that being objective is a value, um, because we you know objectivity should be sort of value neutral, not value laden. Um, but in some sense, those th those things coalesce in scientific activity. Um, also, I think it's very important to find out that there's something sceptical about the, the about science. In some sense, science has to be sceptical about its own findings. And in a sense, that's what that's science. 
is, in some sense, non-dogmatic. It's it 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 it, it, it uh, I mean, Galileo will, of all people will probably be a great example of this. You know, Galileo said that the uh, that the uh, Earth is not the center of the universe, and he came up with a telescope and he he, he looked at the world and he, he saw that he actually no, the sun is. Uh, the sun is uh, the, the the center of the solar system, I suppose, and so he had to have a, a great deal of skepticism about the prevailing wisdom of the day. Now, the question we have to figure out, though, is science immune to skepticism? Can scientific knowledge ossify into conventional wisdom? Uh, I th- I would say I don't think any scientist would probably disagree that in some instances it can. You know, we take certain theories, or we get de- develop pet theories. Uh, where we say that it uh, that 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 we take things for granted, but the scient- the scientists will say that their knowledge is, should in some way be fallible or revisable, revisable. Of course, Karl Popper says ultimately that sort of what constitutes scientific knowledge is that something which can be falsified or something that which is falsifiable. Okay, so those are the things I think that we need to keep in mind when. We are trying to understand what scientists do, how they organize the world. And I suppose what Heidegger is doing is he's kind of testing that a little bit. He's testing that self-conception that he thinks scientists have. Because if you think about it, like, you know, in terms of what sci- the knowledge that science points out about the nature of the world or the external world, you know, you could easily say that that exists, it's, it's there, you know. If you look at an atom through a microscope, you can definitely say it's there. But does that then presuppose that that science, the activity of science, uh, is ahistorical, that it is neutral, that it is disinterested? Uh, Does that presuppose that science is immune to power? and interests, and, I don't know, corporate uh, lobbying, right? All of those political questions. And in, in some sense, I don't think we can say that, you know, the activity of, of science uh, necessarily is, even if the results of what scientists finds could could well be. This is a very pertinent question uh, at the moment. One of the things I've been noticing uh, at the moment in the time, in the age of uh, the coronavirus, is that uh, all of a sudden everyone's a scientist, Right, everyone's got an opinion on testing and tracing, and they're coming up with hypotheses about when we should end the lockdown. And everybody knows something all of a sudden about epidemiology, and uh, I, I think that's, in some sense, that's what Heidegger would call idle chatter. So I think he would be on the side of the scientists there, uh, that uh, that you know that science uh, or scientific knowledge is not immune to opinion okay and i think those are the the the, the kind of stakes now in philosophy when we're trying to understand what science is about we have what's called uh the uh, philosophy of science and our philosophy of science i suppose would be a sub branch of epistemology epistemology is the branch of philosophy which is concerned with episteme with, with 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 knowledge or what counts for knowledge and the philosophy of science would be a uh, an offshoot of that and uh, philosophy of science is uh, the philosophy of uh, how scientific knowledge is constructed uh, I think that's a, a useful uh, provisional way of describing it now um, there's different sort of strains of the philosophy of science I think the first one there is inductivism and that's the, you know that's the stuff we were doing in first year the uh, the the idea that all knowledge is derived from uh, sense experience or from experience, and that's uh, that's 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 uh, uh, our starting point, and that that still I think is the guiding spirit of uh, scientific knowledge. Although I think uh, it would be fair to say that scientists have sort of advanced a lot a, a lot further than 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 say what John Locke and David Hume are talking about. Although, you know, Hume was ultimately into the idea of sort of, you know, th- that we should test knowledge, I suppose. And, and uh, but I suppose as science has developed, the, its methods have become more diverse, more uh, sophisticated for finding out and testing how that knowledge is uh, derived from experience and what counts for knowledge and what's replicable and what's uh, reliable. Uh, 
the uh, other things that the philosophy of science look into is the idea of um, how do scientists uh, form theories. Uh, I suppose the thing that is interesting there and from a philosophical point of view is how it relates to the question of uh, facts about the world. And I suppose the question is, is are facts neutral? You know, if we say that the, the sun is at the centre of the solar system, we can take that as a fact. We can say that is uh, true. Uh, but how theory-laden is that? How independent of theory is is uh, is that so we have to come up with a theory so like say um i don't know say like galileo said a heliocentric theory about how the world is organized then uh is, does does the, is it the case that the facts generate the theory or the theory generates the facts because uh, i think it was Keynes at that you know i change my mind when the facts change so I suppose to the modern ear, the idea is that facts are immutable. And in some sense, for the, a lot of philosophy of scientists, a lot of the more radical philosophers of science, you know, people like Feyerabend and Thomas Kuhn, they would say that no, that facts are not immutable. They're not ahistorical. In some sense, they are constructed. But I suppose, uh, you know, uh, that would be challenged, I think, by uh, lots and lots of scientists for a variety of reasons. Uh, the other dimensions of the philosophy of science are questions of realism. Realism is a branch of, uh, I suppose, epistemology as well, and it's 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 premised on the idea that there is a real world out there, and we can uh, understand uh, knowledge about it, or we can ascertain knowledge about it. Um, and then the other dimension is uh, instrumentalism. Um, these are the these are the kind of the core themes that philosophers of science uh, look at. In, you know, so in terms of instrumentalism is one of the things I suppose that philosophers of science would be interested in is what are the models, what are the theories, I suppose, that come up for, that we come up with in order to organise our observa the observations of the external world. Now there I have a quote there, as you can see, from Ernst Mach. Ernst Mach was a scientist. Um, I don't know much about his science, to be honest with you. I think he was responsible for the, uh, you know, the... Uh, you know, the Mach scale and uh, things to do with the uh, uh, jet engine. But uh, he says, uh, and I think there's a very useful shorthand for trying to understand what scientists uh, do. The goal uh, which it, physical science, has set itself is the simplest and most economical abstract expression of facts. So that's uh, a very simple and elegant way of, sort of summarizing what scientists do. So the goal, the goal of science is... Something simple, I suppose. Occam's razor would be another notion there. You know, the idea that uh, the most, the most likely theory is probably the the theory that which is true, um, uh, and it, the i the idea is, I suppose, what what Mac is saying there is the idea that science is governed by simplicity, and there's a sort of a reductionist uh, element to that, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It might be for Heidegger, but you know, in in when you're trying to do scientific work. Um, you know, an economy of, uh, of 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 knowledge is 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 useful, right? It's it's we we need to find out the most the simplest solution to these complex phenomena which we are trying to explain, and that in some sense then it becomes that's the other word there it becomes abstract, and that's I suppose where Heidegger is going to come in. The abstract nature of science is that it is disinterested is neutral and if it is disinterested and neutral it is in some way separate from the world that's exactly what abstract means it's abstracted out of the world and we come up with a model which we impose on the world whatever that model might be whether that's sort of the new newtonian um view of science the einsteinian view of science the string theory you know, view of science so in some sense when we're doing science, what we're doing, and this is what becomes pardon for Heidegger in the age of the world picture, we are constructing a model. We are constructing a picture of how the world is. And in some sense, for Heidegger, I suppose Heidegger's suspicion, maybe that might be too strong a word, but Heidegger's concern, shall we say, is that what we're doing when we're doing that is we're imposing sort of human constructs on non-human objects. So, say the world, or atoms, or or, or whatever. Okay. Now, um, the other dimension I think that Heidegger is, will start to be worried about is the the idea that the modern scientific worldview is mm. 
in some sense linked to technology uh, and that is true i think you can understand that in a very simple sense that the scientific theories that uh, individuals um, and scientists and uh, come up with in some sense generates uh, knowledge uh, that can be applied uh, to the world and it can be uh, turned into technological output so in some sense there you got uh, science and engineering I suppose right uh, and the idea is that's what scientists fetishize I suppose the idea of that they can get things done you know and all the all the other abstracts and all the other all the other uh, sort of wishy-washy things like philosophy and art and uh, literature they're all uh, they don't they aren't useful for finding out knowledge about uh, the world now so technology is kind of the application of scientific knowledge uh, in a useful way. Uh, technology is uh, the useful development of scientific knowledge, as I say. And I suppose what Heidegger is talking about there, what he's worried about, is that we need to try and understand the difference between uh, the scientific discovery and the historical sort of construction of science and the construction of a theory and the production of a technology that's linked to it. So I think what Heidegger's concerned about, really, is the idea that we are allowing the scientific worldview, and we're allowing the um, we're allowing the um, technological worldview to be the only worldview. Right? We 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 take that as the truth without examining what are the presuppositions. And it's probably why scientists can get a little bit sort of narky sometimes with uh, the philosophy of science because in some sense what philosophers of science often say to is that scientists have a whole pile of uh, presuppositions that they're not really taking into account when they are making these claims about uh, the, the, the order of the world. In addition, we are in some sense... For Heidegger, I think we are losing something when we when we do that, or maybe not losing is not the right word. Or we're well, we're transforming how we think. If we place scientific knowledge as the uh, as the as the as the as the on a on a on a pedestal, I suppose, and we put it at the as and we we put it at the center of our worldviews, and we 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 say it is the only way of understanding the human being, then we have a sort of a diminished form of understanding. And I suppose that's why Heidegger says that science doesn't think. Uh, now, he's not saying that scientists can't think. Um, he's not saying that, uh, you know, that that science, scientists, what scientists do isn't full of, oh, I don't know, the, you know, the great romance of uh, discovery and, you know, uh, invention and the excitement that's attached to that. All of those things are very, very possible. However, for Heidegger, what he wants us to try and think about is uh, what are the underlying assumptions of the scientific worldview, right? And in some sense, it's I suppose it's the difference between thinking, profound thinking, and thinking as, in a very sort of localised, diminished form, as an accumulation of knowledge or an accumulation of facts, right? That's... I mean, you'll see this in sort of debates with Richard Dawkins and sort of over the, the question of religion, which a lot of us studied last year. You know, what sort of Richard Dawkins says about the nature of science is that you know is that we have more facts on our side, and that ultimately is always unsatisfactory. I think, or it doesn't really convince anybody, or maybe it convinces some people. You know, I don't want to sort of overgeneralize, but I suppose the 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 accumulation of facts is just a way of being clever. It's just a way of demonstrating one's cleverness, you know. And it does so in a very sort of a limited way, as in, you know, it does it in a quantitative way. I know more facts than you, therefore my worldview is more fundamental. Whereas Heidegger is saying is that to say that is uh, is to say that is 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 founded on a whole pile of unquestioned assumptions and presuppositions, which is, I suppose, what a scientist would like to avoid. I mean, what scientists would not like to avoid biases? And in some sense, that's what Heidegger is trying to say. He's trying to sort of bring that, um, the philosophical worldview to the scientific worldview, I think. Um, 
let me let me um move move on now in uh, being in time right let's cause cast our mind back to being in time heidegger and uh, his minter husserl phenomenologists and one of the things that they're doing is that they're they're they were lamenting the fragmentation of the sciences they were lamenting the fragmentation of knowledge and in some sense that's what all phenomenologists are trying to do they're trying to bring things together and remember when I was talking to you about Husserl's influence on Heidegger and Heidegger indeed himself they thought that science that the knowledge was becoming too fragmented was becoming too specialized you know becoming too technocratic it was moving into uh, it was being broken up into different uh, different objects so or so like you know there's there's you know the physicists study matter the chemist will study i don't know elements and chemical compounds and uh biologists will study organic life and in some sense that's rather than a progress a progress which we count it as for heidegger that is a quite a sort of that is quite a a fragmentative fragment frag fragmentative uh, it's it's quite a fragmented way of uh, understanding the world there's no deeper connection between all of the different uh, sciences and that was what Husserl thought phenomenology was about it was trying to understand uh, how we can sort of look to philosophy as the, the discipline which uh, is about how all of those conceive themselves how all of those different disciplines uh, conceive themselves um, and I think you know there is in being in time a rejection. I'll put rejection there in inverted commas of naturalism. I say and put it in inverted commas because I, you know, Heidegger is not saying that science doesn't produce useful knowledge. You know, very rarely Heidegger says anything idiotic. He's a very clever, clever chap. And you know, to sort of to reject something like naturalism or the idea that science can be useful or you know that you know science can can be sort of progressively good or we can find cures for cancer or we can find cures for the coronavirus or we can you know find wider cellular degeneration for Alzheimer's patients, whatever. That is that is fine, I think, for Heidegger. Right? That is fine absolutely fine right you know as i said he's not an idiot he's not going to say uh, science doesn't produce uh, useful knowledge what he is asking us to have a think about is he's asking us to ask uh, to ask the question how does science function right how does science work and one of the things he wants to point out uh, i suppose the negative consequences is that we overly if we overly emphasize the scientific worldview we we, we miss out on the human worldview now that's not to say that Heidegger wants to admonish, or sorry, not admonish, but he, that's not to say Heidegger wants to jettison the notion of facts, right? I, that's fine, but he wants to bring to the discourse on facts a sense of uh, the lived human being. So in a sense, what Heidegger is trying to get at with his philosophy of science, if we can call it that, is what does lived factuality mean, right? How do we, as lived human beings, uh, relate to scientific knowledge right and quite often what we do is we we go into the day self we go into the world of idle chatter you know you know i, re I remember maybe a year or so ago there was a there was a study out um i think it was something to do with like you know toast that, that, that i think there was the study was that um that uh that um, you know, burnt toast is carcinogenic, and some or was potentially carcinogenic, and then everyone's going like, "Oh, they say now that you know that you can't eat toast, right?" Or, uh, or you usually the advice on eggs there is a good one. Have, how how many eggs should you have a week? Uh, you know, should it be one? Should it be two? Oh, scientists used to say there was it be ten eggs a week. Now we can only have to have two because it's bad for cholesterol, whatever. That's the type of a. Uh, that's that's what Heidegger wants us to to, to 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 rail against. In fact, I think you know he wants us to you know to not understand science or scientific knowledge in the sense of idle chatter, but also not, I suppose, allow the dominion of science as the only understanding of understanding, the only way we can think, right? So. Um, what is uh, that's that's one dimension of it, right? The other dimension, I think, is that for Heidegger, he's asking us how do science function, right? And if a science is to work, it has to have a certain amount of uh, presuppositions. It has to have a certain amount of um, biases. It takes things for granted, and the thing that 
Heidegger says that uh, science takes for granted is that you know the things they study actually exist. Right? You know, you couldn't be a biologist if you didn't think sort of organic life existed, or you, or you couldn't be a, a, a you couldn't be a physicist if you didn't accept that matter existed, or you know, if you were a chemist, you couldn't say the compounds existed. Right. Uh, so there is an unquestioning dimension involved in science. That's what Heidegger is getting at. And uh, I think probably scientists will not like to hear that. Well, tough, all right? Um, it's important that they do. I, I, but I think the more thinking scientists would. But, and I suppose that's Heidegger's point, you know. Science, it's not that scientists can think, but science doesn't think, all right? Um, if you think about it, if science did challenge or question the existence of those things, well, you know, they couldn't really be scientists, could they? You know, what biologists quite go around questioning the existence of organic life, or what physicists would would uh, would, would would say that you know matter isn't organized in particular ways, right? Uh, and I think that's what Heidegger is saying about the nature of science. You know, that in some sense, science it presupposes certain patterns, certain fields of knowledge. Right, these are what he calls um, a regional ontology. A regional ontology is the famous word. So, like uh, a regional ontology is like uh, you know. So, philosophy is obviously involved with ontology, the nature of being. But a regional ontology is only concerned with a certain aspect of being. Right, in some sense, what science is doing is quite uh, well localized. I suppose I was going to say small, but I think that would be. I would have too many sort of pejorative consequences to it, but localized, right? Again, that's what it is. I guess regional, right? Uh, so what science concern concerns itself with is um, is the rules and methods of the thing which it presupposes exists, and ultimately for Heidegger, that is a sort of a, a, a ultimately narrow way of understanding the organization of being the organization of reality um it's, it's not to say it's not productive or useful again that's the kind of the point it is productive and useful but i suppose for heidegger the uh, the point is that um what he calls a regional ontology um is what is is the is how science operates right and it's kind of something that scientists, I suppose, forget, right? Uh, Heidegger is a lot like, in some regards, he's, a, he's, a, he's kind of like the, the philosopher of science, Thomas Kuhn. Thomas Kuhn says science kind of operates with paradigms. And that's kind of what it was sort of a, roughly corresponding, that's what a regional ontology is uh, for, for Heidegger. What Kuhn meant by a paradigm was, um, I guess, a, 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 a set of cons a, a consensus uh, about what counts as knowledge and you know scientists working within those within those paradigms or within those regional ontologies uh, uh, assume the methods the theories the models for what counts for reality however what Kuhn says and I think this is true for Heidegger it is when science goes into crisis that what it presupposes then comes into light that becomes unveiled that it comes into question right uh, and that is how science, scientific knowledge, pro progresses. Um, it's only when sort of what we doubt about a regional ontology can we say that you know science is actually at the level, working at the level of uh, philosophy. So I think like you know maybe sort of a crisis would be like uh, I don't know, thinking off the top of my head here now, maybe sort of like what when Einstein, uh, uh, you know, Einstein. You know the developments that Einstein did about uh, about um, um, you know sort of quantum theory and things like that that shook up the the Newtonian worldview and that's what I suppose what Heidegger was getting at in some sense how science operates actually is in fact historical you know rather than abstract and neutral and that's why the task of philosophy is something there that that is that is there to try and you know, bring that to to life. Um, I think uh, one other point before I want to move on about that, and that is that in, in, in that the technological dimension of this is uh, is 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 also uh, 
evident here that for you know our Heidegger's critique of technology is in evidence here and this goes back again to being in time um, if you think about being in time one of the things that we talked about was Heidegger's distinction between uh, present to hand and the ready to hand if you recall and uh, and and I suppose this science has its kind of roots in the present to hand right if you think about what the ready to hand was the idea that we understand the the lived world right uh, you know so if we take like famously the Heidegger's example of the hammer you know when we we take the hammer we understand the hammer uh, in in the context of the room it's in in terms of the workshop um in terms of the outside of the the building in terms of the the broader context of involvement right and um what we don't look at when we are looking at the uh, the hammer is how what's the constitution of the hammer in its kind of scientific understanding when we are using the hammer we don't you know look at what what are the you know what is the material construction of the hammer how many atoms compose it and how many particles uh, interact in most specific ways Right, and what Heidegger is uh, saying, I guess, is that the scientific worldview is more akin to the uh, the, the idea of the the, the present to hand, right? Uh, and what that is to say, you know, is that we, science understands the world purely in objective terms. You know, that's what it's about. It's about objectivity. You know, it's about how things are can be understood as isolated things, right? In in terms of their material construction, or in terms of their uh, in terms of their material constitution, okay, and what Heidegger is getting at then is that scientific understanding is actually, you know, metaphysical, which is really, really an interesting thought. That scientific understanding is actually a metaphysical thought because what it's doing is presupposing, uh, 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 what the nature of reality is. It's a theory about the nature of reality, and in that sense, then scientific knowledge is no different to any other philosophical. Um, uh, knowledge, um, or so Heidegger claims at least. So Heidegger claims at least. Cl claims at least. Now, if we if we think back uh, also uh, to being in time, there's also the uh, theories of uh, truth that we talked about, and uh, Heidegger is again trying to. Um, when I did the lecture on Heidegger and truth, I talked more about these, but just to recap quickly, in being in time, I guess. Science, the scientific worldview is motivated by the theories of truth. Now, in truth, uh, in philosophy, uh, the, the sort of the working definition of truth, what constitutes truth, since Plato is justified true belief. Uh, you know, you have a belief about the nature of the world that says organizes according to a state of affairs, and you find out truth by justifying whether that is the case or not. Okay, and we're a really useful working definition of what truth is, right? And that is. That finds itself in these the theories of truth that Heidegger talks about, so the correspondence theory of truth, the uh, coherence theory of truth, and the pragmatic theory of truth. So the correspondence theory of truth, again, just just briefly, is the idea that uh, truth is a, that there has to be a correspondence between a subject and a set of state of affairs in the world. The coherence theory of truth is about um, the coherence of, uh, say, different propositions about the nature of the world and different theories of the nature of the world or how the nature of the world is. And it does say, it does, like in a very elementary sense, does my propositions about how the world cohere with your propositions about how the world is. And then in some way we can come to a, a theory of truth when we figure out how things are corresponding to states of affairs in the world. And then there's a pragmatic theory of truth, which is, which we get in American pragmatism with uh, thinkers like uh, William James and John Dewey, which is very, very interesting, actually, but I don't really have time to talk about it here. Well, r roughly the idea is what truth is, what is useful. Um, um, OK, so now that's there, the theories of truth and uh, what Heidegger, I remember what Heidegger says, sorry, is that... Um, that's you know we need to I'll just bump ahead slightly there um we need to bump ahead uh, uh what Heidegger talk think about truth is I say is truth is not oppositional now truth is what is unhidden it's ecstatic and in some sense is connected to nature of course yes physics is connected to nature and physics is a branch of science but uh what Heidegger is more interested in is not so much the instrumental understanding of truth but he's interested in how truth comes to be Right, so when I say truth is not oppositional there, I'm saying that for Heidegger, in some sense, truth needs to set aside the subject and object understanding of the world, which the correspondence theory of truth does. Now, the correspondence theory of truth, again, they're all very useful and instrumental, but 
they don't understand sort of the deeper understanding of truth i think you know the truth is not oppositional you know it's not a sense of you know exactitude versus inexactitude or it's not a uh, uh, an understanding of truth as um as a, as a subject who arbitrates a, an object uh, in the world in some sense you can set those things aside for heidegger truth is both in a sense right truth is uh, exactitude and inexactitude in the age of the world picture he talks about this he's going back to sort of the the greek understanding of what accounts for philosophical wisdom and in some sense philosophical wisdom and is is is, is socratic you know ignorance and knowledge are intimately linked and I think that spirit is in science. We, we should not forget that. You know, I said that at the outset of the lecture that one of the great sort of things about sort of scientific knowledge is this is scepticism. You know, the scepticism is anti dogmatism, right? And that's what uh, that's what Heidegger is 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 is, is trying, I think, uh, to uh, to get to. Um, so um, the um, let me just sort of move slightly back then. Now, okay, so those so Heidegger is trying to have a more, I suppose, expansive understanding of the notion uh, of truth. All right, well, right now, famously, a couple of years back, you might not remember this, but uh, yeah, there was a, it, well, you, you you see it, you see it every now and again. Somebody in, in popular culture, or uh, you know, a, a scientist will 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 go, oh yeah, philosophy is a bit crap. So, like I think uh, Stephen Hawking said, philosophy is dead, in one of his last books, I think. Uh, more recently, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's a, an astrophysicist, I think, uh, he's kind of said that uh, science, philosophy is useless. Science makes philosophy obs obsolete. Now, when I when I you know when I was when I heard that, I was like, oh, I was like, oh, 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 God, here we go again, right? Another scientist started dissing philosophy. I don't know when I kind of looked into what he was saying. Uh, he was kind of saying that uh, philosophy is not a productive contributor to our understanding of the natural world, of the natural world. And th it's the word productive that uh, is interesting to me there, right? Because uh, in, in a sense, I think he's probably right about that, you know? If you want to cure cancer, or a, ca a form of cancer to be more precise, you know, you're probably not going to come to me, right? Uh in, in uh, you know science is about producing things which work and which 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 help us organize uh, our world or you know they can help us destroy our world if you want if you want to think of the sort of the um say like the 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 the, the, the byproducts of science such as with which we find in uh, in the military or atom bombs and the like okay um so but it's the, the that word productivist right and i think what Heidegger's concern with is not so much the idea of the regional tie that, you know, scientists can tell us knowledge about, uh, you know, the chemical compounds or can tell us, can give us knowledge about, I don't know, whatever, for coronavirus or, or, or whatever, right? Of course it can, right? But uh, what Heidegger is saying that science doesn't do is it doesn't think about the type of thinking that it's bringing about and the type of thinking it's bringing about is productivist thinking that's where it where it links to the question concerning uh, technology it uh, we start to understand the human being in a very quantitative very mechanical and a very calculative uh, quantitative way and science and its offshoot technology for Heidegger is changing thought and it's only allowing us to think in productivist ways in a sense and this is this is not necessarily a bad thing right for Heidegger, thought, you know, within the regional ontologies, thought becomes limited and predetermined, right? And that's what science is about. It's about, you know, it's about determination. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, well, of course, for Heidegger, the, the, the opposition of free will and determinism, you know, the opposition of free will and determinism is the idea that if something is determined causally, then one cannot be free, or if something one is free, one is, you know, cannot be determined. And ultimately, for Heidegger, that's, I think he probably thinks that's somewhat an idiotic debate that 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 opposition, right? You know, you know, we we need to we need to be to do thinking. We need to think these two things in tandem are operating together in a similar way. We need to think uh, truth, right? That's why the most uh, 
the most exciting form of science is the most the science which is about you know discovery and invention and and uh, creation uh, okay so um, all of this right lets us know that for, that for Heidegger what philosophy is doing right is that is I suppose philosophy philosophy uh, is I suppose a therapy or curative perhaps to the more negative dimensions of scientific thinking or the more productivist dimensions of scientific thinking you know uh, what philosophy shows us is that science is ultimately a projection it's a projection of human models onto nature onto phusis right onto physics uh, and ultimately what Heidegger is saying, you know, in the age of the world picture when he says that what science does is, is a projection onto nature, what he's saying ultimately is that what science is is a belief. Now, that's a great thought that science is just one belief among many. Now, as the, this is why scientists are going to hate this because they will go, of course not. What science does constitutes knowledge and knowledge is the opposite of belief. I mean, you know, you know in that sense, scientists are Platonists, right? Uh, they, they, they correspond to the Plato's theory of the divided line, right? That there is a hierarchy of knowledge and, you know, belief and opinion is kind of secondary or belief, or belief and opinion is knowledge in the making, whereas knowledge is, is something separate. But which scientists will say that they're Platonists? Which scientists will say that they're Platonists? They will not say that. But that's what Heidegger is saying, that they actually are, right? Now, um, Ultimately, then, I suppose what Heidegger is talk, thinking about is uh, what are the I suppose the the negative understanding of 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 science, right? And that's that science and technology change thought, or they change thought to such a degree that it becomes unthinking. It no longer is thought. If if thought is limited and determined and is not sort of free and creative and adaptive and historical, it is not thinking for. For, for Heidegger. So what he's, I guess what he's saying is that uh, science transforms all objects into sort of a, a flat picture. And that's the age of the world picture into, into a form of understanding that's quantifiable and uh, measurable. Now, moving on. Uh, this then is, I suppose, the sort of the, the more nihilistic dimension of science. Now, I don't think Heidegger goes that far that he says scientists and what scientists do, scientists do is automatically nihilistic, right? or is necessarily nihilistic, but it certainly can go that way. The scientific worldview is of seeing human beings as dead objects, as mechanical objects. Now, the... Um, what Heidegger, of course, is more interested in is trying to understand the design of the human being. He's trying to understand what we are, right? Science understands human beings as objects, as beings which have an essence, right? Uh, and in a sense, philosophy is trying to understand the historical understanding of the human being, that humans are trying to show that humans are not the beings that science speak of. Now, what I mean by that is that, in some sense, the human being is not determined. Well, the human being is somewhat determined, but not absolutely determined, Right, and as we get that, we get that sense in Heidegger where we need to try and think both of these things uh, simul simultaneously. Right, um, then the age of the world picture. Um, Heidegger's all he's really asking us, I think, and all he's really asking scientists to do, I think, uh, is to try and um, to think uh, philosophically. Um, and if you think about it. Um, we need to think about science, and science needs to be thinking. That's its deficit, well, at least for Heidegger. You know, that's why it doesn't think, right? Because science is this massive thing. Science and its, you know, how it affects uh, engineering, uh, and how it affects um, industry and sort of the economy. Um, for Heidegger, that reveals the the essence of modern life. That's the essence of modern life, and science, which we normally think. Which we are, we quite often think is uh, is is valuable, right? Uh, is is um, 
is is not necessarily so. Is not or not always so. Not always so. Or I think he's trying to get us to refigure how we we think of it because he doesn't want us to understand everything in sort of purely uh, schematic terms. All right. Um, he doesn't want Heidegger is always Heidegger. I think the thing is right. Heidegger is skeptical and cautious about any form of thinking that is kind of fixed and rigid. All right, he's trying to think of um, um, you know, what, about what is it, what type of thinking does science give it? Discuss and remember when we're talking about the question concerning technology, he says the modern worldview is kind of governed by the efficient causality, right? Uh, and the efficient causality is kind of a very mechanical way of understanding the world. And Heidegger thinks the contemporary science in his period. Uh, works with the expectation that the world will always behave in a certain way and um, that therefore means that the world will operate in a very very efficient way and then if you if we if we start thinking that then we only start thinking of the human being in just efficient terms or mechanistic terms or causal terms right and science right and science as a as a as you know as people work uh, our scientists work and examine things and detect things and try to find out things about the nature of all sorts of things like uh, about technology and engineering and biology and chemistry and physics. But what's the scientific worldview, the scientific ethos, also obligates scientists to think in a very limited way, right? And that's what I mean there by, you know, method precedes nature and history. The age of the world picture is a human projection onto nature. Uh, and what we do is we think that science is um, sort kind of a mathematical projection onto nature. We think that science is simply an explanation of what, well, what I suppose we already know, what common sense already bequeaths to us. Uh, but Real science, I think, for Heidegger. Real, real, real science. So I suppose that's what he's saying. Like, I, I, I don't think like that. We can make the claim that Heidegger is a relativist. I always say that in sort of being in time, and you know, there is a, there is a, there is like a, uh, there is like a, a, a theory of truth in Heidegger. He's not saying he's not kind of like a sophist. He's not saying anything can mean anything, or all things are equally true. Right. In fact, you know. Uh, I think what he's, he's what, he, what, he, what he's saying is that, you know, the way science operates, right? The way science operates is kind of it operates in the opposition to common sense, right? However, the way science works is that quite often it becomes unphilosophical, right? Scientists, you know, um, sci scientists fall into consensus; uh, they develop pet theories. They, they have sure they have the means of sort of testing those theories and revising them, uh, but it, they, they are not immune to that sort of the pull of uh, opinion and common sense, right? Um, and I think what he's trying to say is that that sort of you know so he's not saying like Heidegger is not saying you know he's he's not saying that um, you know he's not gonna I don't think he'd be like an anti-vaxxer or something like that you know he's not saying that you know that what science finds out and what science tells us about the natural world shouldn't uh, inform how we think about the world, how we project ourselves onto the world, how we orientate ourselves in the world, right? Of course it should, but we should think of that in terms of lived factuality. You know, the facts about the world are as historical as anything else and their understanding has to inform us in a, in a lived sense. And uh, the best science, I suppose, is the science that kind of, that moves in the opposite direction to sort of conventional science or to contemporary to contemporary versions of science um and in some sense that's kind of how science operates you know if you look at it historically science develops new methods new models new instruments new experiments uh which will you know, help us accommodate you know the changing nature of the world the changing processes of the world as they uh, uh, occur, right? Uh, and if you think about it, if it didn't, if it doesn't, if scientists don't do that, 
it would just continually be uh, stuck on the old rules, old methods, old ways of understanding. We would still, if that was the case, we would still think that the that the sun is the center of the uh, the universe. Sorry, lost you there for a second. Um, so I think what Heidegger is getting at is that it's only um, yeah, science operates at the sort of at the juncture of all the new beliefs uh, about the the that the that the that the world how the world uh, operates or exists. Uh, it's only you know. It is only after the fact, really. After the fact is an interesting way of putting it, or when new beliefs come to light, uh, that we can find evidence uh, to support them, or we can find evidence to corroborate our initial theories. All right. So, um, so I think really what Heidegger was trying to do there is he's trying to figure out how science reproduces itself, right? Uh, and I suppose he's. He's, he's, he's concerned about how the scientific worldview uh, kind of infects uh, our everyday thinking, right? And I think that's what he says that the that uh, one of the one of the problems with science is that it I suppose it sort of doesn't understand its limits, and it has this sense that the world is functional, it operates in a coherent way, and it's uh, operated in a planned way. Right, and in technological sense, then that contributes to the technological thinking for Heidegger called the standing reserve. Right, that the world is just objects, and those objects are there uh, to be to be used. And that's why I got that quote there: "Man founds and confronts himself as the authority of measure for all standards of measure." In a sense, that is the expression of sophistry. In the sense of that's what Heidegger is saying. He's kind of saying that in a way that that uh, that sort of the modern scientific worldview, right, is a form of sophistry. It's a form of rhetoric. It's 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 a way of persuading us about a picture of uh, the world. And what it does is, I suppose the the I suppose the concern is that it turns us into subjects and uh, and uh, and objects, or it splits us into subjects and objects. That's why I say there that science leads to the pursuit of object ob objectivism. So the pursuit of objectivism leads to subjectivism, which is kind of a tricky way of putting it. But I think it's kind of a simple enough point because the age of the world picture understands the world in a coherent, planned, mechanical way. It understands the world as sort of a, a network of objects. And if the world is a network of objects, we kind of see it as over there, as separate to us, right? And Heidegger's kind of asking, right, why do we take that world as real? Or why do we take that 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 scientific view of the world to be more real than, say, where we live, where we exist, who we love, and all of those questions, right? The metaphysical questions. And in a sense, he's trying to, you know, he's trying to draw those those things uh, those things together, all right? Um, so. I guess in summary, then, um, I think what what Heidegger is doing, right, is he's trying to ask what is the historical nature of science? How does it work? How does it develop? You know, what are its presuppositions? What biases are it? Uh, and he thinks that modern science, in some way, is unthinking, right? As in some sense, in some way, science is, uh, or it has the it has the tendency it can be it can lead to form very sort of dogmatic forms of uh, uh, of in inquiry now in some sense i think that's necessary why because for heidegger sciences are regional ontology ontologies they take for that means they take for granted peculiar or particular domains of inquiry right whereas heidegger is more into the idea i think that science is a you know science operates as a form of beliefs and science is uh, not as exact as i would like to think it is uh, but science is also something where we get uh, we can get a synthesis science can i think have a have a some kind of synthesis of that notion of exactitude and inexactitude right um that's when science is being philosophical, because when science is in its own in its own world, in its own domain, then that is when it is unthinking. I think that's what he means by the idea that you know science doesn't think. 
right? Uh, in fact, it's only when 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 science falls into crisis, or science is scientific a scientific consensus is challenged or undermined, that we can come up with uh, new ways and theories of understanding uh, the world. Now, what uh, in 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 uh, in terms of um, in terms of sort of bringing it to conclusion, then let me just say a couple of things. I so I'm going to try. I started with the question: science does not think, right? The other sort of quote I want to bring you from Heidegger is the idea that only a god can still save us, which means we're screwed. I think so. Heidegger is sort of pessimistic about our our outlook and our worldview. Um, one of the other quite things he says is that questioning is the piety of thought. Questioning is the piety of, of thought. Um, so, we, you know, in some sense, that's kind of how we can understand Heidegger. Right? Heidegger is kind of between sort of scientific knowledge and philosophical knowledge. Right? If science doesn't think, right, and questioning is the piety of thought, he is in some sense seems to be advocating. A notion of lived factuality. Now Heidegger is not, I think, you know, Heidegger is saying he's in that kind of Platonic tradition. He kind of sees the human being as, as he sees the human being as in 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 a world. You know, the human being is Dasein, is being in the world, right? And the philosophical implications of that are that we have to conceive of the human being as both as both the being that questions and also the being that thinks right and to say that then is to say that the human being for heidegger is the being that is you know is constitutes something as like between you know sort of truth and magic in a sense that's what philosophy is it's both disciplines. It's both of those things uh, together. Now, I have to be careful there. You know, Heidegger is not like you know, he's not like David Blaine, or he's not saying we should be magic, or he's not saying we should be, you know, uh, you know, performing magic tricks. But in some sense, that's what philosophy is. Philosophy is the the discourse which is not irrational, and is not is not excessively irrational or superstitious for certain, but it's also not the the discourse that is excessively rational and logical and mathematical it's both it's both and that's what real thinking is that's what real thinking is drawing those two contesting impulses of the human being uh, together right that's why i talk about the idea of lived factuality in, in heidegger sort of lived factuality is what is 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 is, 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 is what i guess sums up his uh, understanding of the philosophy of science right that the um that the that the that the that the world is um that the world and how we understand it is a sort of kind of a, a strange and enigmatic synthesis of knowledge and possibility. So science without possibility, without invention and creation is diminished in as much as you know, philosophy without <laughs> rationality, clarity clarity and truth uh, is also diminished, and that's what sort of real thinking is. I think that's the type of thinking that Heidegger is exhorting us to engage in when we are trying to understand where we are in the world and trying to understand the place of the human being in relation to all of the technological developments and medical developments that we are currently existing under. Okay, I'll leave it there. When we're coming, uh, when you're coming the next day. To the seminar, I think there's a couple of questions that I'd like you to think about. Try to think, ask yourself, you know, well, ask yourself about how does science affect your life? In what ways does science reproduce itself? Is science historical? And also, what is a fact? Talk soon. <laughs>